Easter is just a few weeks away, and uh, in preparation for Easter, we have been taking a compressed journey through the Gospel of John, and specifically, we've been looking at the miracles that Jesus uh, performed in the Gospel of John, or he actually doesn't call them miracles. We'll get to that in just a second. He calls them signs, and so we've been taking this journey uh, leading up to the Resurrection Sunday, and as we begin today, I want to cons- for you to consider two questions, all right? And one of you, you'll have to you know, think of one of them for yourself uh, because it doesn't, uh, both of them don't apply to you. Why should you follow Jesus? There are some of you in, in this room right now uh, that maybe you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian. Maybe you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus and you're just kind of t- kicking the tires on this whole Christianity thing. And you're wondering why in the world should I follow Jesus? And then there are others of you who would say, I am a Christian, I do follow Jesus. And my question to you is, why do you follow Jesus? What's your motivation behind wanting to follow Jesus? This is an important thing uh, to the apostle John as he writes his uh, book. He, he writes his book for a specific reason. There's, he's got an agenda and you find out what his agenda is at the very end of his gospel where he writes in chapter 20, verse 31, these words. He says this, but these, he's talking about the signs uh, and the miracles that he records of Jesus, but these are written so that you may believe Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, that there is something here that he wants you to have. And he's like, of all the things and the teachings and the miracles of Jesus that I could have uh, written about, I chose these specific ones for a reason, that is to lead you to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life. And John did not start out as a, uh, as a believer in Jesus. He, he saw Jesus' life unfold before his very eyes. And over time, the things that John writes about in his gospel are the very things that caused him to place his trust, his belief, his faith in Jesus. And John uh, devoted his entire life to Jesus, all of it, as his king. And so John writes this gospel so that faith may be formed and so that faith may be sustained. He wants to bring you and he wants to bring me into a a moment of faith where we're uh, yielding our entire life to Jesus as our king. And that after we do that, that, that his gospel and how we read and how we study through his gospel will not only bring us to that point, but will sustain us in our faith and our following Jesus as well. And so there are uh, three different words the New Testament uses for this idea or this concept of miracles. The first is just the word miracle itself. It means a display of power. And specifically, it's talking about a display of God's power. So when you read the word miracle, it's, it's, that's what it's talking about, a display of extraordinary power, speaking of God's power. Another word is the word wonder. And that is basically the effect of the miracle. In other words, when miracles were done, people were astonished. Uh, They were without words. They they couldn't believe their eyes. And so that that idea of wonder, it just created a sense of wonder in people. And then the last word, the third word is the word sign. And it points not to the effect or not to the power of the miracle, but to the significance of the miracle. In other words, what is this miracle pointing to? Everything that Jesus did, he did for a reason. He came for a purpose. And as you read through the gospels, whenever he taught something, whenever he performed a sign, a wonder, a miracle, it was for a specific reason. And so John is saying, hey, I've chosen these things to help build your faith, to lead you to faith and help sustain your faith throughout your life. And so today, if you brought a Bible, and I would encourage you to do that, we're in John chapter 6, at the very beginning of John chapter 6, or maybe you've got it on your mobile device, we'll be camping out in John 6, reading a number of verses today. Uh, And it says this in John chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, after this, 
And we'll get to that in just a second. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. Now, John, uh, there was a sea, and it wasn't really a sea, it was more like a lake, uh, but he calls it the Sea of Galilee, which in Jesus' time, when Jesus was uh, growing up, that's what it was called. But it later became known as the Sea of, or the Lake of Tiberias because the emperor, uh, the Roman emperor came in, built a city, the city was called Tiberias, and since it was next to the Lake of Galilee, it ought to, uh, you know, eventually became known as the as the Sea of Gal or the Sea of Tiberias, and so, what, why I talk about this or why I mention this is is for this one reason. It lets you know and lets me know that the document, the Gospel of John, John wrote this. Not it, it wasn't written hundreds of years later. It was written when the name was still in flux between the two different names. Some people knew it by the Sea of Galilee. Some people knew it by the, uh, the, the Sea of Tiberias. Either way, John says, for those of you who know it by one name or the other, I'm talking about the same thing. Had this gospel been written 300 years later, he wouldn't have said it's the Sea of Galilee because no one would have known it by that name. And so that's evidence, internal evidence, that this is an early document from the gospel of John. It's authentic. And then in verse two, it says this, a huge crowd was following him because, and here's the idea, there's a crowd following Jesus. Remember the questions we just asked, why do you follow Jesus or why should you follow Jesus? Well, this crowd was following Jesus. Why? Because they believed, they had faith, right? Because, um, uh, because they loved him so much, right? That's why we would say we follow Jesus, perhaps. But that's not why they follow Jesus. It says in the rest of verse two, uh, they follow Jesus because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. They saw what Jesus was doing and they were chasing after what he was doing. Verse three, Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival was near. Now, just a little bit about this. There is about six months between the end of chapter five in John and the beginning of chapter six in John. At the beginning of chapter five, uh, John records that Jesus went down to Jerusalem for a festival. Uh, and in the beginning of chapter six, it says Jesus was back up in Galilee prior to the Passover coming. So the festival that he attended in uh, in the beginning of chapter five, if it was not Passover, then it was another festival that would have been six months out from the Passover that Jesus was getting ready to go back down into Jerusalem for. And so uh, there's six months here. A lot has happened in that six months. If you go to the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find that most of the content between Matthew chapter 5 uh, and Matthew chapter 15 or chapter 4 and chapter uh, 14 is all done in between John chapter 6 and John chapter 5. Jesus has been performing miracles all over the place. He's taught the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he is like, his stock is rising. He is a rock star in the area. Everybody knows about him. And so Jesus, when he goes up into the, uh, the Galilee, he goes up on the side of this, this mountain or this hill to get away from people, to have a little R&R, &R, to, to get away, break away from the crowds. And so it says in verse five, so when, the, uh, so when Jesus looked up, he noticed a huge crowd coming toward him. Um, this miracle that we're getting ready to look at, I should tell you that it's the only miracle of all the miracles that Jesus performed that is recorded in each of the four different gospels. And so you would say, hey, if all four gospel writers recorded this miracle, there is something, uh, there's a big deal about this miracle. And so if you want to go back, John compresses this miracle to focus on the details that he wants to, to highlight. But if you go back and read the other uh, writers of the gospels, you'll find out that the, Jesus has been on the side of this, this mountain or this mount uh, by the Lake of Galilee for an entire day. In fact, in Luke chapter uh, 11, verse nine, it says this, or chapter nine, verse 11, it says this, when the crowds found out, right? They followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. 
And so in the next verse, uh, Luke will tell us that later on in the day, Jesus comes up with a question that we're gonna get to in just a second, but he's been there all day. So he's teaching them. Uh, Crowds are coming and he's healing all of the crowds and people start to hear that, hey, Jesus is out here. He's around the Lake of Galilee and you've gotta go see him. And so Jesus, um, all these people start coming around Jesus and then it comes back in and it's later in the afternoon and he says at the end of verse five of John chapter six, he says, he asked, he turned to Philip and he asked him, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? Um, Philip, I, I want you, I wanna figure out, I mean, we've got lots of people around here, but I want you to figure out where are we gonna buy? Where are we going to buy bread so that they have something to eat? And why did he go to Philip? Because Philip, we find out earlier in the Gospel of John that Philip was from this area. This was his hometown area. This, if anybody would have known where bread could be bought, it would be Philip. And so Jesus comes to Philip and says, hey, where can we buy bread around here? You know all the shops, you know all the bakeries, you know all this. Where can we go to find all this bread? And so um, Philip says, okay, well, I know the places, but let, and he starts to calculate He starts to calculate and it says in verse six that Jesus said this to Philip to test him for Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. I don't know how that verse lands on you that Jesus did this in order to test Philip. Like Jesus knew what he was getting ready to do but he threw a little pressure in Philip's way. Um, There are times in your life and in my life where God will test our faith. But when God tests our faith, he does it so that our faith will be developed, it will be strengthened, it will grow. And that's exactly why Jesus is throwing this question out to Philip. He's thrown Philip into a tizzy, as we'll see in just a minute, but he did it in order to grow Philip's faith, to strengthen Philip's faith. In verse seven, Philip says this, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. You say, what's, what's a denarii? Denarii is a day's worth of an average worker's wage. In other words, he says, Jesus, I, I'm just telling you, uh, if we had eight months worth of salary, worth of you know, income from people, it wouldn't be enough to give everybody a little snack. Gives you the idea that there's a, there's a big crowd brewing here. And Philip says, you know, even if, we, even if we were able to do this, we can't buy, we don't have enough money to buy all of this. We, we would need like, you know, wagons and carts going around with all the gold and silver and cash. We don't, we don't have that, Jesus. And even if we had that much money, it would only buy a little snack for people. It, it's not gonna get done what you want done. And then in verse eight, It says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. So as Philip's trying to figure out where to get all the money and where to buy all this stuff, Andrew, who is uh, Peter's brother, he goes around and is like, all right, all right, let's, let's find out what we do have on hand. Maybe people got, and he, of all the people he searched, he found one little boy and this boy's probably, it's not a teenager by the way it's uh, constructed in the Greek. It's a little boy, maybe five, six, seven years old is there. And he has five barley loaves and two fish. Now, um, when you read of loaves of bread, it's not like, you know, wonder loaves of bread that you'd buy at the grocery store. And he's like, you know, in, with the knapsack. Um, in wealthy people, just incidentally, wealthy people on that day didn't use barley for bread. They used wheat for bread. So this is a little boy, he's poor and he has five barley loaves of bread. And when you think of that, think of small pancakes. So he's got like five small pancakes worth of bread and two fish. And these aren't, you know, like eight pound bass that he caught the you know, day before out of the Lake of, uh, of Galilee. These are, think little sardine uh, type that have been heavily smothered in salt and they're dried out and they're flaking all around and he probably puts them and scrapes them on the bread so it kind of becomes like relish. I know, it's not very appetizing, is it? Lunch is coming, you know, wouldn't you like to have barley bloves, right? And a little dried out fish. But that's what he has. And then Andrew says, but what are they? What are these loaves and, and fish? What are they 
for so many. Like Jesus, um, you know, Philip telling you we don't have the money and I've done an inventory of, of what we got on hand and uh, I'm just telling you, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna cut cut it. Like it's not even gonna, I mean, this little boy's gonna go away hungry after he eats all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's not much. And Jesus has created in this moment, he has pushed his disciples to the edge of their ability. He's testing them. He's doing this on purpose. Let me ask you, when in your life uh, have you been at a point where you feel like it's beyond your ability? Like you, you got nothing else. All of your ideas, you know, you've, you've, you've thought through all that. You don't have any resources. You're just kind of like, I, I don't know. Well, when you get to that point, that's a really good place to be because that means that God is ready to move in and do what you can't do. And Jesus' disciples doesn't know what's coming. I mean, no one's seen this. They're not thinking this. They're not, they're thinking, in fact, the other gospel writers, they record that the disciples said, hey, Jesus, why don't we just send them away and let them figure it out on their own? Wouldn't you like to have them be your pastor? You know, just go figure it out. I don't know, be warm and blessed, go on your way. And Jesus is like, no, 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 we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. And Jesus, as we'll see, he takes these five loaves and fish and, and the little that is given to him, he does a lot with. Verse 10 of our text says this, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. And the other, uh, Mark records that not only was there plenty of grass, but it was green grass. Now I don't know if you've ever been in the Middle East, but it's not known to be like, it's, it's the desert. A lot of it's in the desert, right? Well, uh, both, all of the gospel writers talked about the grass. They were probably thinking, hey, when we got up here early in the morning to get away from people, just to kind of rest and relax, in their mind's eye, in John's mind's eye, he's remembering the grass that was there. Mark, who got his information from the apostle Peter, Peter said like, yeah, it wasn't just grass, like it was lush grass. And they all record this detail. And... Um, I wonder why. And I think, and this I can't be for sure about this, but I think it's because they're connecting. After the resurrection, they realize, oh my goodness, after the resurrection, they're realizing, hey, this really is God in human flesh. And so they're connecting this famous passage from the Old Testament, and they're drawing this in. It's that passage that you've probably heard. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. That word, when Jesus said to have them sit down, it's actually have them recline in the grass. And I wonder if the disciples just thought, oh my goodness, that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what Jesus did. And then at the end of verse 10, going back to our passage, it says that the men numbered about 5,000. The men numbered about 5,000. You say, um, well, James, why is it talking about the men? But because they were counting heads of households. It's not that there were only men there. In fact, Matthew says that there were 5,000 men besides women and children. So this is a, this is a big crowd. I mean, this, this is a massive crowd. Uh, Jesus had four brothers and two sisters. In other words, there were seven children in Jesus' family, which would have been at least average in that day. And so if you do the math on this, if there are 5,000 men and only half of those men were married and they all had the average of seven children, you're looking at somewhere between 21 and 28,000 people on this, in this area. Like this is a massive crowd. I think this is why all of the gospel writers record this miracle. It's like, it's the largest miracle Jesus ever performed. It's like, you gotta, oh yeah, remember the day when? This was astonishing. And so the disciples come, when Jesus presses them, they're trying to figure it out. They realize we don't, we don't have anything. And in the other uh, accounts of this event, they're saying, send the people away, let them figure it out because they're thinking we're dead in the water here. Like there's no way we can do this. They're not thinking that Jesus is actually gonna do something. They're trying to convince Jesus to let it go. They don't have faith. You see, 
Faith grows by obeying Jesus even when you don't know what he's up to. Faith grows by obeying Jesus even when you don't know what he's doing. So Jesus says, hey, um, go have people sit down. And they're thinking, sit down? It's getting late in the afternoon, Jesus. We ought to be you know, dismissing the crowds, not having them sit down. And the other uh, accounts of this event, uh, they record that Jesus had them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. So you've got 20 plus thousand people there and the 12 disciples are out there saying, hey, hey, hey uh, can, can I get you guys over here? Can you just like form a, like a circle of about 50 and just, and just lie down on the grass? If you were in that crowd, uh, what would you have asked the disciples? Why? Somehow, I don't know, but somehow through the whole crowd, they, they gathered in them groups of fifties and hundreds and everybody just kind of, and the disciples are thinking, what are they? Th I don't know what they're thinking. They're thinking, okay, I, I don't understand why Jesus wants us to do this, but if this is what he's asked us to do, we'll do what he asked us to do. I, it makes no sense to me. And there will be moments in your life when obeying Jesus will make no sense to you, but obey him anyway. Like you're thinking, no, 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 Jesus, not, not that way. I, this way seems better to me. Like this makes more sense to me. I, I know what you're saying. No, 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 no. This, I wanna do that. Look, when your wisdom and God's wisdom like come up against each other, uh, you're wrong, not God. Okay? Faith grows by obeying Jesus even when you don't know what he's up to, even though you don't understand, that's when obedience is most important. Now look in verse 11, back in verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves and after giving thanks, so he prays, he thanks God. He gives thanks to God. He distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish as much as they wanted. In other words, remember what Philip said, hey, even if we had all the money, it would just be a little snack. And Jesus performs this miracle. The miracle is done in the hands of Jesus. The other uh, uh, accounts of this event, uh, Jesus says he distributes the food, not by himself, but through his disciples. John compresses the event and just says, yeah, Jesus did this miracle, but the other writers, so what Jesus does, and we'll see in just a second, they rounded up 12 bushels, baskets, and Jesus takes these loaves and, this, and these little small fish and he just starts filling these baskets up. And when the basket got filled up, he, you know, the disciple went over and fed this group of 50 or this group of 100 and, and then they, and now you understand there are 20,000 people. This is taking a while. It took them a while to get everybody seated, didn't it? And so now they're going out and they're serving just 12 of them. How many groups, so you can do the math, how many groups of pockets of people? It's a lot, hundreds. And so one by one, one group by another, have you ever been to a big meal and they say, you know, it's a buffet and, and it's like, we're gonna release you by tables to go up. You're like, please make my table the first one, right? Everybody's like, start over here. And so they start to go and they distribute this food in obedience to Jesus and they're, they're in awe. You know they are, they're in awe. It's a massive amount of food. A uh, number of years ago, back in the 90s, there, was, uh, there were some men's events called Promise Keepers and men would go to football stadiums and there would be like this, you know, big gathering of men and preaching and, you know, singing and all that. And I remember the first one I went to, they said, we're gonna do lunch today on the grounds. We're gonna dismiss you and we'll be back in here in 90 minutes. I'm thinking, Ain't no way you're feeding 60,000 men in 90 minutes. I mean, it takes a while to get out of the stadium when the stadium's packed, right? You, you know, it takes, takes a while. And then to get back in, and it was like, no way. And so I remember, I never will forget walking out of the stadium and they're in the parking lot. As far as you can see all the way around, there are these tables with boxes of food as high as you, and all you went through as quick as you did is you just grabbed a box of lunch. You went out and found some place around to eat. You ate. You threw it all away and you got back in the stadium. 
lots of trash, lots of food. I was amazed. I was like, I can't believe they just did that. That's a lot of food. My point is this. This is a massive amount of food. It's a massive amount of food. And you have to understand that when the people were there, they they started to get the, the idea of what was going on. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, when they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Verse 13, so they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Everybody has more than enough. It's not like they, you know, they were looking, they, they had their seconds and thirds and fourths. They're like, oh my goodness, like we have, this is a feast, not a snack. This is a feast, not a snack. And all of a sudden people start to realize, wait, 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 wait a minute. Where's all this food coming from? Where are the food trucks? Like, again, you've got 20,000 people out there. Where's all this, where's, where's it all being set up? Where's it all being staged? There is no staging for the food. It's just appearing. Again, if you're in that crowd that day, you're looking around us, you're on the top. I mean, if, if, there, if there was somebody, you know, you, you couldn't hide that amount of food. And people are starting to say, uh, something's going on here. Like, we just keep on asking for more. Hey, can we get some more over here? Yeah, circle number 73 needs some more. Come on, Andrew, pick it up a little bit. And Jesus is there. His arms are probably tired. He keeps on, you know, dumping it in, dumping it in, dumping it in, dumping it in. And people are starting to realize, whoa. There were over 20,000 witnesses to this miracle to this feast. What do you think happened to the disciples' faith in all of this? (laughs) Went way up, right? See, faith grows by seeing that Jesus is not limited by the weakness of our faith. Faith grows by seeing that Jesus is not limited to the weakness of our faith. There's an occasion in Matthew chapter uh, nine, verse 29, where Jesus heals someone and he makes this statement. And a lot of people make, a big deal about this statement, but Jesus says, as uh, to the level of your faith, or to the degree of your faith may be done to you. And so there are a lot of people these days that say that God heals in accordance with your faith, that he only does miracles uh, based on how much faith you have. And so modern day faith healers go around and they, you know, supposedly heal people. And then if a person doesn't get healed, they'll blame the person for not having enough faith. If you just had enough faith, God would do this. It's not my fault your fault. But that's not really how God operates. Uh, The apostle Paul would write in uh, Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, that God is able to do more than we imagine or think. Like your highest thoughts, your best thoughts of Jesus are short of his ability. Like He can do far more than you can imagine. He said, well, James, I can imagine a lot. I'm just telling you, he can do far more than you can imagine. You see, if Jesus' ability were limited by our faith, then he wouldn't really do very much, would he? Sometimes he didn't do much because people weren't really looking for it. That's true. But here's an occasion where the disciples had no belief. They had no anticipation of what Jesus was gonna do. They were trying to get people away, and yet Jesus had different plans. He's like, we're going to feed them. No, we can't feed them. That's not a little faith. (laughs) That's no faith. That's no belief. That's no trust. And then it says in verse 14, when the people saw the sign, and they knew it was a sign, this was unbelievable, this miracle, like, No one could deny it. No one ever has tried to deny it. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said that they start to make a connection. Hey, this truly is the prophet who was to come into the world. That Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 talked about a prophet that would come later on and and he would do amazing things. 
And they're saying, hey, maybe this is the prophet. Maybe this is the prophet. And then they start thinking, you know what? Passover is right around the corner. There's, you know, thousands of people here. There are gonna be tens of thousands of people converging on the city of Jerusalem in just a few days. G- We've been watching, G- I mean, uh, Jesus, uh, one scholar said that Jesus healed so many people in the area of Galilee that he virtually eradicated all disease and sickness. Like it, it wasn't that Jesus just healed a few people, he was healing crowds of people. Like you wanna live in Galilee when Jesus is there. Don't need doctors, don't need hospitals, because Jesus is there. And so they're thinking, hey, he just fed. And remember, he's like Moses. Moses, Moses was the guy that was in, in charge of the nation of Israel when God rained down manna from heaven and they ate. Jesus is able to do that. He's the prophet. And they had this expectation that this prophet would also be this messianic king. And so you can see where they're thinking. There's a big crowd. Thousands of people are gonna be converging onto Jerusalem. We should make Jesus king. We'll march into Jerusalem. We'll throw off the oppression of Rome and we will have our freedom. A new Moses. He's the prophet. Verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, um, Jesus realizes what's going on here. He's like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. First of all, I did not come to be a political king. I'm not a political revolutionary. A lot of people want to make Jesus into a political revolutionary. That's not his deal. Jesus, hey, listen, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. I got a whole nother deal going on this. I mean, you can try to make me what you want, but I'm just telling you. And so what did Jesus do? When he realized what they were up to and he realized what they were excited about, this is what it says in the rest of verse 15. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. In other words, he, he slipped away, he disappeared. He disappeared. Let me ask you this question. What is the one thing that you would most want Jesus to do for you right now? If you could ask Jesus to do anything for you right now, what is the one thing that you would most want Jesus to do for you? Maybe it's a prayer that you've been praying for a long time. You've got this concern and you're just like, Lord, if you could just do this one thing, just this one thing and I'll never ask you for anything ever again. Maybe um, it's a cause that you feel very passionate about, like, Lord, we, we got to get this done. And so if I could, you know, if I could wave a wand and you could answer this one deal, I would like resolve this cause. I, I would resolve this cause. Or maybe there's a, an evil that if, if anything, if you could just do anything, you could eradicate this evil. If you could ask Jesus to do one thing for you, what, what would that be? So we all have something, don't we? We all have something that we're saying, Lord, if you, I know you can. I mean, I think you can. But if you can do this, it might be healing. It might be a restoration of a marriage. It might be something about, you know, finances. It might be a career. It might be, you know, it might, like I said, it might be a cause, something that you're just like, this has got to end. What would it be? You see, and this is, This is where this passage really zeroes in on us because the temptation that we face is that having some idea of the power of Jesus, we will see Jesus as a means to an end, a means to your end. That's what a lot of us have turned Jesus into, isn't it? Like people will say, you might run into somebody, yeah, I used to to be a Christian. I used to go to church, but you know what? It just really wasn't working for me. I didn't. Nothing really was happening. Or some people say, you know what? I, I, I'm not a Christian anymore. I, I don't go to church anymore. Why? Because uh, s- s- this thing happened and I prayed for God. I begged God. I begged him and he didn't answer. So I'm done. I'm angry at God. He didn't do what I wanted him to do. I think we've all been there, right? Where we've been disappointed with God because things didn't turn out the way that we thought they should turn out or the way that we begged him that they would turn out. He didn't resolve the problem. He didn't heal. He didn't 
act on our behalf or on somebody else's behalf that we thought he should have acted. And, and then all of a sudden, we're like, well, maybe God can't do anything about this. I prayed that, you know, my loved one wouldn't suffer. I prayed that this would, and, and so I'm, I'm out. You see, that's when we turn Jesus into a means to an end. We're really, we're following Jesus just because of what we think he can do for us. And this crowd on this day in John 6, that's what they were all about. Hey, Jesus, uh, you just fed like 20,000 people and you didn't even break a sweat. So we're poor, we have barley love. I mean, that's what you multiply, you multiply barley. Look, we're poor, so if you, we're just gonna hang around you and you just keep feeding us. And by the way, we've seen you heal, so you could be like the leader of the army, and if guys get, you know, hit with a sword or whatever, you just heal them, and, you know, we'll be invincible. Like, this is it. This is what they're thinking. We're going to make you king. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You just want me. You're following after. You're chasing after me because of what I can do for you or what you think I can do for you. But that's not how this thing works. Later on in John 6, Jesus thins out the crowd. In fact, the entire crowd left and they no longer followed Jesus. He did this on purpose. In fact, it was so bad that Jesus looked at the 12 disciples after everybody had left in a huff over what Jesus was doing and saying, they left over a huff and Jesus looked at his disciples and said, are you, are you gonna leave, leave me too? You see, if, if we try to use Jesus as a means to our own end, in the end, you will lose Jesus. They were gonna make him king. They wanted him to keep on filling their bellies. He was like the genie in the bottle. And, and for them, uh, it was like this. Hey, Jesus, come here, boy. We, we need your help. Come over here, boy. And that's what a lot of us do. And what did Jesus do? Remember, they were gonna make him king. They wanted more food out of him. And what did Jesus do? He disappeared, which is why I say, if you try to use Jesus in the end, you will lose it. Because that's not, that's not the deal. You see, the life of faith is not a life in which you decide what you want from Jesus to do for you and then only follow him if he does it. That's why so many people fall away. That's why over the last three years, you know, across the world, people who used to fill churches and be a part of churches, they're just gone in large part because I, I think they just thought Jesus was a means to an end and times got tough and they're out. They followed him because of what he could do for them. And when he didn't come through with what they thought he should do, they just tap out. You see, it's not a life where you set the agenda for Jesus and then if he doesn't you know, follow through with your agenda, you're out. Um, the Christian life is a life in which you follow Jesus, you trust Jesus, you obey Jesus, even when, even when you don't know what he's going to do or how things will turn out. You're not in it for what he can do for you how he can fix your marriage, how he can provide financially, how he can get your kids in the right school. How you, you're not in it for that. You should be in it for who he is, not what he can do. And that's really our bottom line for today. Our bottom line for today is simply this, follow Jesus for who he is, not for what he can do for you because eventually you're gonna be disappointed because Jesus doesn't come to your beck and call. He doesn't do your agenda. He's got his own agenda. And our job as followers of Jesus is to jettison our agenda, our, what we want, and follow him as our king, as our captain, as our leader. And when he says no to us, we don't get mad and shake our fists at him. We're saying, hey, you're in charge. I'm here for you, not you for me. And so we follow Jesus for who he is, the son of God, not because of the things that he may or may not do for us. Why? Here's why. 
because it is impossible, listen, it is impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone from whom you are always trying to get something. You have relationships, friendships, marriages, where the the relationship is over because all the other person wanted was what they could do, what you could do for them. It never works. And if it doesn't work in normal relationships, why in the world would we think it's going to work that way with the God of the universe? Application. What do you do with all this? A couple of things. Number one, you need to acknowledge your own limitations, your own inadequacy, and the power of Jesus. You need to acknowledge, um, so oftentimes in life, we come up against a jam and we're, we think in ourselves, I'm gonna fix it. I'll get this done, I'll get this done. And the last minute we'll pray. Well, at the last minute, it's like, no, 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 no. We should come to that moment before and just say, Lord, I, you know what? <sighs> I've got nothing, but here's what I, I, I have. The little thing that I do have, I'm just asking you to multiply it. I'm asking you to do something extraordinary. And I'll, I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but I'm gonna walk in obedience because when I walk in obedience, my faith is strengthened. You need to acknowledge your own inadequacy and the power of God. Sometimes we give up on things because we think there's no way this is gonna work. And God's like, uh, excuse me, did you not read about the signs? Trust, follow, obey. Second thing is this. You need to evaluate why you or why you are considering following Jesus. Has Jesus become a means to your end? Because if he has, that's all gonna fall apart. Why are you following Jesus? Why are you, if you're not a Christian, why are you here today? Are you here because you're desperate? And you, you, know, you want Jesus to help you? And again, he, he's helped all of us in some way Right, And we're grateful for it. And every time he does, it's a, it's a gift of his mercy and grace. He's not obligated to. But why are you considering following Jesus? Um, you should consider following Jesus because he is the son of God who willingly gave his life for you so that you could be reconciled to a holy God. And if Jesus never does anything for you, except for that one thing. He is deserving and worthy of your entire devotion of everything that you are and everything that you have. His agenda, not yours. Follow Jesus for who he is, not for what he can do for you. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, so grateful that John took great pains and thought and consideration to string together these signs, these miracles, these wonders that Jesus performed in order to point us to who you are. And Father, we're grateful for this um, account in John chapter six where uh, Jesus just kind of throws down the gauntlets like you're just chasing after me for what I can do for you. And Father, so oftentimes we're pulled in that direction But Lord, um, as we consider who you are, uh, Father, we just wanna yield our lives to you that if you never did anything for us except for what you've already done on the cross, that that would be enough. And we would gladly live our lives in allegiance to you, all out faithfulness to you because you are worthy of that. Thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.